This is episode 24 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott H.A. Johnson. This is the penultimate episode. One more to go, folks. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. You can still support us through patreon.com slash sajjohnson, but really at this point, I'd rather you just review the book and share it with a few friends. That's all I ask. That'd be the best repayment for all the time and effort I've put in at this point. And thanks for listening. This podcast contains fleeting explicit language and my dog's nails clipping on the wooden floor behind me. Sorry about that. Chapter 60, Shutting Down Coal, Fall 2016. Headline, Coordinated Attack Cripples Coal Power Plants Across U.S. September 18th, 2016. Washington, Wired News Agency. Ten power plants were targeted by a radical ecological terrorist group, resulting in explosions at eight of the facilities over the last seven days. According to investigators, explosives disguised as coal were fed into the plant's stored fuel areas. Before being burned, coal is milled into a fine powder, and it is at this point that the explosives went off, destroying the mills and crippling the plants that they feed. The eco gorillas have claimed responsibility for this attack in a communication sent to media outlets. According to their communique, the group has targeted power stations across the U.S. Sharer, Georgia, Miller, Alaska, Lake and Parish, Texas, Labadee, Missouri, Gibson, Indiana, Gavin, Ohio, Mansfield, Pennsylvania, Monroe, Michigan, and Navajo, Arizona. The Miller and Gavin plants have not shut down or experienced explosions. The list also represents the highest emitting coal-fired power plants in the U.S., which is not by chance. The group, designated as a domestic terrorist organization by the FBI, confirmed the method of planting explosives in the coal supply and the coordinated targeting of what they call the, quote, most egregious emitters of greenhouse gases, particulate matter, and toxic chemicals into our air and soil, end quote. This group gained notoriety for its role in the destruction of the Glen Canyon Dam, as well as attacks on Yellowstone National Park and mining executives. This attack is their most destructive to date, but their communication promises more to come. Quote, We have seeded the coal supply of over half the nation's coal plants, focusing on the top 10 offenders this week, the top 100 next week, and a random selection of the remaining 447 plants the following week. Either you shut down your plants now to avoid endangering your employees and damaging your equipment, or let them run until your mills explode. Either way, we and everybody else who likes to breathe air, wins. End quote. Four of the eight power plants that experience explosions have restarted operations because they could continue to mill coal in unaffected units, as many power plants have more than one mill, operating in parallel. The companies responsible for the stations have released statements ranging from defiant to antagonistic. The American Coal Council has released a statement claiming that the, quote, criminal targeting of coal-fired power plants is an assault on America, its people, and its government. Our industry will continue to provide power to our country as part of a comprehensive energy strategy. We will not be intimidated. End quote. Headline. Coal power stations continue to experience terrorist attacks. September 20th, 2016. Washington. Wired News Agency. Just days after the defiant statements from the American Coal Council and individual power plant operators, dozens of stations experienced mill explosions causing them to cease operations temporarily. Eight of the ten largest coal plants were struck last week. The remaining two plants, Miller in Alabama and Gavin in Ohio, continue to operate until they experienced explosions yesterday. Four of the original eight plants continued operations in their secondary energy production units until three of these units were crippled by explosives as well. Approximately two dozen other plants have been shut down due to explosions in the last two days. Another dozen stations on the list of the 100 highest emitting coal plants have ceased operations out of caution, but these operators have been criticized by industry peers as well as members of Congress as caving to the demands of the eco-gorillas, the people claiming responsibility for this action. The group has released a second statement on their attacks, arguing that, quote, the true assault on America, its people, and its government comes from not us, but the coal industry itself, end quote, reversing the meaning of the American Coal Council's statement of three days ago. Quote, you can choose to shutter your plants now or let them continue to explode. We've been seeing coal trains with explosives for months, and the only way to guarantee the safety of your workers and the people around your plants is to shut them down. But since you've disregarded the health effects of your business for decades, we expect you to continue your belligerent endangering of life, end quote. The FBI, for its part, has launched a full-scale investigation of this group as it has now embarked on a nationwide attack. Previous actions were geologically isolated in Wyoming, Arizona, and a few other areas. Only a few arrests were affected in these cases as the ringleaders continue to elude capture. Similar attacks have been reported in other countries. Just days after the attacks began in the U.S., plants in China, India, Australia, Russia, South Africa, Germany, and Poland were either victims of similar explosions or received warnings that they had been targeted and should cease production. It is too soon to tell if these are coordinated campaigns, copycat attacks, or empty threats, whereby radical environmentalists use the situation to leverage action on coal use. Headline, Rolling Blackouts as Nuclear, Natural Gas, and Renewables Strain to Fill Coal Electric Gap at Home and Abroad. 
September 26, 2016. Washington, Wired News Agency. As nearly 97 coal plants have suffered terrorist attacks affecting the mills that prepare coal for use, and almost 100 more plants have shut down, fully a third of the nearly 600 coal plants in the United States, the nation braces for rolling blackouts as power demands cannot be met with other energy generation. Only a week ago, the first power plants were attacked by the radical environmental group known as the eco Gorillas, who placed explosives in the coal supply of plants across the country. Each day since has seen a growing number of explosions at energy-generating facilities. Only in the last few days have some companies elected to shut down their power plants out of an abundance of caution, as stated by one executive. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, coal generates 30% of all U.S. electric consumption, compared to 32% from natural gas, 20% from nuclear power, and the remaining 18% from renewable energy. These sources cannot make up the 10% loss of total power generation with one-third of the coal plants offline. Without enough electricity in the grid, the systems become unstable and blackouts have become common during peak energy use. Officials have urged a reduction in power use, but as homes use only 37% of total generated electricity, individual consumption cuts cannot bridge the gap, and industry and commercial sectors have been asked to cut back. This distribution of blackouts varies by location, however, and states more heavily dependent on coal have suffered the most, with West Virginia, Wyoming, Kentucky, and Missouri, which rely on coal for 77-94% to of their total power generation, hit hardest. In Rhode Island, Delaware, and Mississippi, natural gas already generates more than 80% of their electricity, and the shutdown of coal plants has had less of an effect. And yet other states rely on a mix of natural gas, hydropower, nuclear, and renewables to operate without coal, including Maine, Connecticut, Idaho, California, and Vermont. The international situation is similar, as grids in Europe and Asia depend on coal for a fifth, Europe, to a third, Asia, of their electrical generation according to the European Environment and International Energy Agencies. Grid administrators have attempted to ramp up natural gas and nuclear generating stations to fill the gap. Although Asia has less capacity to shift their generation, they also use less energy per capita, so the disruption has been somewhat minimized. Germany and other European countries are suffering less than the United States, as they depend on renewable sources for almost a third of their energy and have greater natural gas and nuclear capacity. Note, EEA 2018, IEA 2017, US EPA 2014. End of note. End of chapter. Chapter 61, Reducing Dependence on Vehicles, Fall 2016. Headline, SUV sales decline amid continued harassment and gas station attacks. September 17th, 2016. Chicago, Wired News Agency. Citing social ostracism and attacks on the fuel infrastructure, industry analysts have identified a sharp drop in the sale of large and quote-unquote gas-guzzling vehicles. At the same time, dealer associations report record sales of not only hybrid and all-electric automobiles, but also electric scooters and commuting bikes. This trend began over the summer with irate SUV owners reacting to antisocial bumper stickers and road rage incidents, which were captured in videos that went viral. The situation worsened as motorists around the country began to antagonize larger vehicles who are more likely to be self-centered and aggressive according to studies in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences and Traffic Injury Prevention. In one study, drivers of more expensive vehicles were shown to be more likely to cut in line at a four-way stop or continue through an intersection when a pedestrian had the right-of-way. Another study found that high-performance vehicle drivers were more likely to perpetrate road rage. Drivers of large vehicles have reported that other motorists have been targeting them by intentionally slowing down to the speed limit, honking for no reason, and otherwise getting in their way unnecessarily. It is difficult to prove these claims, and many of the actions are illegal, but the social and media posts of these drivers, some with videos showing the alleged harassment, are compelling and may indicate a real trend. Note, Piff et al. 2012, Smart et al. 2004. End of note. Dealers of electric vehicles, scooters, and bicycles have reported record sales this quarter. When reached for comment, Dan Snyder, owner of Chicago-area chain of scooter stores, reports that the top reasons for purchasing one of their electric mopeds and bicycles is the disruption in the gasoline market and to find a more eco-friendly way to commute. Quote, With a range of 30 miles, most people can get to and from work on a single charge, says Mr. Snyder. I have even had people buying solar panels to charge up their vehicles without having to use the grid. Ridiculous, says Herb Banthroff, president of the Midwest Hummers Dealer Association. This isn't a long-term trend. If we look back at the history of the American love affair with cars, we see them getting bigger and better every year. This is just a blip. When asked about the road rage and harassment incidents, Mr. Banthoff was dismissive. It may be happening, but it's hard to tell. There were so many oblivious drivers who didn't get out of my way last summer, too. End of chapter. Chapter 62. Nation's Corn, Soybeans Threatened. Fall 2016. Jack, this is Glenn. How are you? 
Glenn could hear the squeak of the chair hinges in Washington, D.C. through the phone. Glenn? Glenn Stein? Oh, gosh, it's been a while. I'm fine. So is Lewis. I'm retiring next year. Jack Larson still sounded like his native North Dakota, even after decades in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's main office for the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Good. Congratulations. Well, I've got something for you to work on before then. Glenn, hold on. I've been reading your articles. I know how worried you are, and yeah, things could get bad, but so far, we don't have any systemic risks. They're just not there. Are you sure? Glenn waited and then heard a sigh. Okay, what is it? I've got a locust that prefers glyphosate and... Yeah, but most Roundup-ready crops have... BT, I know. What I was saying is that they prefer glyphosate and they have a mutation that allows them to digest BT. It actually makes them feed heavier because they get diarrhea. Glenn waited again to let it sink in before continuing. Didn't you hear about the county in Iowa that had the freak crop failures due to insects? Yeah, of course, but that was an isolated incident. This year was isolated. What do you think those insects were? I got some samples. Glenn lied. He had been behind the trial release of his gregarious, sterile, all-male locust, and they had unusual physiology according to the entomologist I talked to. He said they had extra serotonin receptors. Uh, okay, what does that mean? Swarming. But North America doesn't have swarming locusts. Well, that's not exactly true. We had the Rocky Mountain locusts, but they went extinct at the turn of the last century. Then there were the High Plains locusts during the Dust Bowl. In other parts of the world, locusts swarm when a growth phase follows a drought. But Iowa didn't have a drought before the growing season last year. Right, that's the problem. I don't understand. I'm saying the population that ate through the crops in Decora did two unusual things. First, it swarmed, and second, it did so for no reason we know. The DNA testing says they were able to cover the county in just a few generations. It was a High Plains grasshopper in Iowa. They said it was the Carolina grasshopper. Nope. Uh, So they're similar, and we usually don't see the plains in Iowa, but the etymologist was certain. And here's the problem. Remember how they dispersed around July after destroying the crops? They laid their eggs in August and September. Note. USDA, 1958, page 67, figure 4. End of note. So you saying they could spread? In the Dust Bowl outbreak, they went from just a few counties around the Panhandle to hundreds of counties in under four years. I don't know what these guys will do, but I just got back from Iowa and found them in three dozen counties around Decorah before I ran out of time. It's August, so they'll be spreading and laying eggs for another month. Jiminy Cricket. You said it. After he hung up the phone, having given Jack his recommendations to issue a warning about the potential for significant crop damage in 2017 and promising a full write-up of his findings, Glenn turned to Julie. What do you think? he asked. He sounded convinced. I'm glad we were able to just release enough to show the damage in one place rather than having to really allow those buggers to spread. It's clear enough threat that it should scare them into contemplating a change for next year. I hope this whole thing goes off, or I'm going to be in hot water for falsifying this information. I mean, I'm sending the USDA a report on a threat that doesn't really exist. Well, they prop up an agricultural system that is endangering our long-term survival, and yet they don't issue warnings about the real systemic problems or recommend ways to fix them. It's all reactive, and we're making them be proactive. Headline, USDA warns of super locust danger to nation's corn belt. September 21st, 2016. Washington, Wired News Agency. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has issued a warning for Iowa and surrounding states concerning a strain of grasshoppers that appears to be immune from genetically modified crop defenses. According to a report submitted to the USDA, swarms of High Plains grasshoppers, a species responsible for widespread crop losses during the Dust Bowl, were identified around Decorah, Iowa this summer. The warning describes these grasshoppers as unusual because they not only prefer the taste of Roundup Ready crops, which represent the vast majority of corn and other crops today, but they are not affected by the Bt toxin added to most of these plants. This genetically engineered toxin usually disrupts the digestive tracts of insects that ingest it, but in this case it causes diarrhea and increased feeding. Additionally, these grasshoppers appear to be more likely to form large swarms, something not seen in the lifetime of any North American farmer. The USDA has recommended that farmers diversify their plantings in the coming year to include non-Roundup-ready varieties as well as crops other than corn, soybeans, alfalfa, canola, and sorghum, top U.S. products that are both Roundup-ready and contain the BT modification. This is an unusually broad and dire warning from the usually conservative agency according to many industry analysts. End of chapter. Chapter 63. National Disaster Preparation Pays Off. Fall 2016. Headline. Nationwide Panic and Recalls as E. coli Found in Fresh Produce and Frozen Foods. September 26, 2016. Washington. Wired News Agency. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued three recalls this week, which, taken together, constitute the largest outbreak of foodborne danger in U.S. history. 
The CDC's warning cover many frozen foods in all of Californian and Mexican produce. Last week, a whistleblower alerted authorities that Nestle and ConAgra Foods had both been alerted to widespread E. coli in their frozen products. The whistleblower worked for an independent testing company under contract with both companies. According to the complaint, the industry giants continued to ship their frozen foods while waiting for confirmation of the results. Previous outbreaks of E. coli in frozen products were quickly traced back to a single food and packaging plant. This latest recall, however, is widespread and victims were sickened by eating a variety of products. The CDC states that, quote, Due to the widespread nature of this contamination, we recommend destroying all frozen Nestle and ConAgra foods until we can identify the source and extent of the E. coli bacteria. While it is understandable that these companies were shocked by the pervasiveness of the contamination, it is inexcusable that they shipped product while waiting for a second test to come back. End of quote. This is a catastrophic blow to the companies and consumers, as these two producers account for over 40% of the U.S. frozen food market. As the CDC warming came out last week, retailers have reported a dramatic drop in all frozen food sales, not just those affected companies. Quote, The problem is that Nestle and ConAgra have many brands under their umbrellas, so consumers seem to have decided just to avoid all frozen foods instead of risking purchasing a potentially contaminated product, said Theodore Demp, president of the National Grocers Association. Quote, we should stress, though, that all of our retailers have taken affected products off the shelves and anything our shoppers find in their freezer cases are safe, end quote. Nevertheless, the industry organization reports sales declines of 80-90% to 90 in the frozen food sector nationally. Just as the initial panic of the frozen food contamination was subsiding, the CDC reported another E. coli outbreak today, this time in produce from California and Mexico. Another whistleblower raised the alarm about this contamination. Agency testing of produce about to be distributed across the country confirmed the presence of the bacteria. California produces about half of the fruits, nuts, and vegetables grown in the U.S., including almost all artichokes, dates, raisins, kiwi, almonds, and many others. The recall of E. coli-contaminated leafy greens has become commonplace, but this time the CDC is putting a hold on all fresh produce from California and Mexico because it is unclear if the bacteria is being introduced in the field, processing plants, or transportation network. People have become ill after eating different types of produce grown on farms from northern California through central Mexico, distributed by various companies and regional distributors. In short, the CDC is unsure of where the contamination originates and has put a hold on all produce sales until it can be identified and mitigated. Note. Parsons, 2014. End of note. Headline. Grocery stores mobbed for shelf-stable food amid CDC recalls of produce and frozen food. September 29th, 2016. Washington, Wired News Agency. Just days after the largest recall in U.S. history, affecting both fresh produce and frozen foods, grocery stores across the country are reporting record sales of canned and shelf-stable goods. In scenes more typical of impending regional disasters such as hurricanes or blizzards, images across social media show empty shelves and full carts nationwide. Quote, Grocery store staff and distributors are working together to refill shelves as quickly as possible, said Lynn Savage, the Senior Vice President for Communications and External Affairs at the National Grocers Association. The effort is hampered in part due to the blackouts and power shortages caused by the terrorist attacks on the nation's coal power plants. The grocery industry no longer relies on regional warehouses full of goods, as it is not cost-effective to leave products sitting out of customers' grasp, according to Ms. Savage. The current system uses a complex shipping network and electronic inventory databases to alert distributors to what is needed in each grocery store. While this just-in-time stocking system works well for the industry's bottom line, it is more easily disrupted by transportation hiccups, such as natural disasters or severe weather. End of chapter. End of episode 24 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.